Let us pray. Loving God, open our ears and our hearts to hear the message that you would have for us today. Amen. Many parents would agree that some of the best conversations with their children have taken place while traveling together, whether by foot or by car. Quite a while ago, I heard about a fascinating conversation that a mom had with her three-year-old son. They were in their vehicle on a Saturday afternoon. The mom was driving from one errand to another with her son in his car seat. The conversation, though, was not so much a conversation as a string of questions. As they drove by a pond, the mom suddenly heard from the back of the car something like, why do ducks put their heads in the water? She thought for a second and responded, because that's where they get their food. Another question, why do they get their food? Mom answered, they need food for energy. Why do they need food for energy? This continued for about half an hour. The little boy asked questions, the mom responded with answers, which bred new questions. I was told there was a time of silence, but then suddenly there was an oh from the back of the car, and the child excitedly recounted his newfound knowledge about ducks. The mom realized that with each question her son asked, and as the wheels turned within him, as he listened to his mother's answers, he was coming closer and closer to understanding ducks. In today's New Testament reading, Jesus is asked a question by a teacher of the law, or in some translations, a scribe. This question in our reading follows other questions posed in the verses that come before today's reading. Jesus had been asked questions by the Pharisees, the Herodians, and the Sadducees. It seems that these previous questions had been asked in an attempt to trip Jesus up. Our reading states that a teacher of the law who was listening to the arguments was pleased with Jesus' response. The question that he asks of Jesus does not seem to be asked to trip Jesus up but is asked with a trust in Jesus' ability to answer the question correctly. The teacher of the law asks a question that spoke to the core of their Jewish faith. He asks Jesus, what is the greatest commandment? Jesus responds by reciting the Shema, the Lord our God is one God. Love your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. The second is to love your neighbor as yourself. There is no greater commandment. After hearing the response, the scribe congratulates Jesus and adds that love of God and neighbor is more important than all burnt offerings. Jesus comments on his wisdom and states that he is close to the kingdom. In a commentary of Mark's gospel by Cl C. Clifton Black, he says that Jesus recognizes discernment within the scribe's question and answer. Clifton speaks of this final question in the series of questions that Jesus had been asked in these words. To cut any deeper would be to reach the marrow of discipleship. After 2,000 years, we still come with questions. Our questions, like the question posed by the teacher of the law, are important as they seek to lead us to a closer understanding of who Jesus is and how we are to love God and neighbor. 
our questions, especially those that we share with one another, can bring the kingdom of God into clearer focus as we gain new perspectives and understanding. What happens, though, when the weight of our questions and concerns seem to overwhelm and distort any closeness of God's kingdom in our world? When we are bombarded with challenge or tragedy in our private lives, or by the news of shootings and other such disasters in our world today. It can be challenging to feel a sense of closeness to the kingdom of God, especially in a world in which the motto seems to be to look out for oneself and one's own. As I reflected on this question, I realized that the book of Ruth which appears in our lectionary reading to get today, provides a focal point for exploring this question. Again, this is the dilemma. What happens when the weight of our questions and concerns overwhelm and distort any sense of a closeness of the kingdom of God? The book of Ruth is one of the smallest books in our Bible with only four chapters. In looking at commentary, there has been much debate of the meaning of the story within its pages and the exact time in history in which it had been written. The book is placed in different places within the Jewish and the Christian scriptures. The words within the beginning verses of Ruth, however, provide at least the writer's intended context for the story of Ruth. Our Old Testament reading today begins with these words. In the days when the judges ruled, the time when the judges ruled would have been known by the first listeners of Ruth as being a particularly gruesome time within the history of their people. The book of Judges, which is placed just before Ruth in our Bible, documents horrendous events. The book of Judges ends with these words of expl explanation as to the reason for this. The scripture states, in those days when Israel had no king, everyone did as he saw fit. The book of Ruth's purpose then seems to be to speak in some way to address the time in which everyone did as they saw fit. Ruth appears to provide a bridge in understanding how their people have moved from their era in which judges ruled towards a building up of the house of Israel through God's faithfulness. Ronald M. Howells in the theology of the book of Ruth proposes that the hiddenness of God is a major theme within the book of Ruth. He explains that although God is mentioned within the book, that there is no direct revelation of God given. It is not like the book of Job or Jonah where we see the characters interact directly with God. He proposes that Ruth's main message is God's providence, seen through the ordinary. He speaks to the hope that comes at the end of the story. I believe such a reading of Ruth can be helpful. However, as I pondered over today's verses, I grappled with this. Within today's reading, we don't get to the punchline to see how God's providence is revealed. As I contemplated this, it struck me that in our lives and those that we know, or in the lives of those who we are made aware of through news releases, we can't skip quickly to the finish line. Concerns can't always be neatly wrapped up in four quick chapters nor can many of life's questions be answered in a half-hour car ride 
So again, what about when our concerns and questions seem to overwhelm and distort any sense of the closeness of God's kingdom in our world? I invite you to explore with me the story within the story of Ruth that we have before us today. We are given a background. There's a family who are from Bethlehem and Judah who travel to a country of Moab due to a famine. There's a husband and wife and two sons. And we're told that the, the husband dies. The sons marry Mo, Moabite women. And after about 10 years, the two sons die. Naomi, the, mo the mother of the two sons and the mother-in-law of Oprah, Opar and <laughs> Opar and Ruth hears that the famine in Bethlehem has, is over, that there is food once more. And so she decides to return. All three women leave where they are, li leave where they are living. On the road, though, Naomi wishes her daughters-in-law well and implores them to return to their own kinsmen. Neither wants to leave Naomi. At this point, Naomi utters her why question. This why question, however, is unlike the preschooler's why question in my earlier story. It is not asked to, to seek new understanding. The question is spoken by Naomi, why will you come with me, is a rhetorical one in nature. This why question is spoken in order to set up an argument. It is spoken to persuade others of Naomi's point of view. She is saying, why would you go with me? You won't get anything from me. I have nothing to offer you. And this, I guess, is the judge's worldview, and perhaps our own worldview at this time. Opar does as her mother-in-law wishes and leaves. However, Ruth clings to Naomi and pleads not to be made to abandon her. We then hear Ruth's words, and she says, where you go, I will go. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. I pray that not even death will separate us. Catherine Dube Sackenfeld explains in her commentary that it was very important to be buried with one's ancestors in countries of the ancient Near East. In Ruth's saying that she would not be separated at death, she is really saying that the commitment is complete and irrevocable. Naomi is unable to shake Ruth off. Ruth is not interested in either her excuses or put off by the fact that Naomi isn't excited for her to come along. She is sacrificing her own future in order to continue with Naomi's journey, not even knowing, perhaps, what she would be able to do for Naomi. Naomi's yes is a resigned one. She allows Ruth to accompany her simply because it is evident that Ruth's determination will not waver. Commentaries speak of faith and action we see in Ruth lived out, of how the commandments are lived out in loving neighbor as self. And it seems that this could be a very good interpretation. I wonder, too, if we see an illustration of our God, our God who at times we just cannot shake off, our God who is committed to be with us and that even death cannot separate us from. 
Maybe it's a combination of the two of these. Maybe in seeing Ruth, we see a God who will always be there. And we can be reminded of seeing God in others and seeing God work through us. Before I finish, I would like to share with you one last thought. And it's something that I will be reflecting on as I go um, into this week, and I invite you to reflect also. And it is this. Many children of God would agree that some of the best conversations with God as their Heavenly Mother or Heavenly Father have been amidst the journey. Whether it has been a sense of peace that God is listening during times of endless questions, or whether it has been in receiving a well-timed call, phone call, from a friend who cares. Let us go into this week ready to seek afresh signs of the kingdom of God. Amen.